an IT infrastructure failure case study, enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation, and how to simplify digital transformation. Those are just a few things we're going to cover today in episode number 137 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. I'm also your host here today, and with me hosting, as always, is Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here today. Happy to have you, and happy to have the audience here as well. We've got a great episode lined up for you. Again, this is episode number 137. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of transformation. We have new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, where we stream live every every Wednesday morning, U.S. time or afternoon or evening in uh, Asia Pacific and Europe as well. So be sure to check us out there, or you can check us out on audio podcast platforms. So if you listen to podcasts on Apple Podcast or Amazon or Google or wherever, um, check us out there. You can find new episodes every Wednesday. So great episode for you today. We're going to kick off the opening segment with some questions from the audience. We're also going to get into a couple hot topics, uh, two hot topics in particular. One is um, three steps for successful digital transformation. And within that conversation, we're going to talk about an IT infrastructure failure case study involving Southwest Airlines in the United States. Uh, one of the largest airlines here in the U.S. had uh, an IT infrastructure failure that we'll sort of dive into to queue up what it takes to be successful in a digital transformation. And then the second hot topic we'll cover in the opening segment is Blueprint for an Automation Mindset, uh, which will be a great conversation as well. And then later in the show, we'll have Mehdi Aftahi from Technology Evaluation Centers, aka TEC. Um, he's going to be on the show talking about enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation. So if you're going through a digital transformation, you're deploying new technologies within your organization, you'll want to stick around for that conversation because we'll talk about enterprise architecture and how it all fits together or how it should fit together within a digital transformation. And then last but not least, we'll play you a couple uh, video clips from our YouTube channels that we thought would be of interest here to the podcast audience. Uh, one is how to simplify digital transformation, and the other is how ERP influences business cost. Um, so we'll get into some of the, the business uh, costs and benefits of, of enterprise technology uh, in that clip as well. But before we get to those segments later in the show, let's uh, get into some of the audience questions you've got for us, Kyler. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you haven't joined us before, you can drop your questions on any one of our social media platforms, both Third Stage and Eric's channels um, with hashtag Ask Eric, and I will bring those questions live to ask him in our episode. You can also pop the question wherever you're joining from today. We always love to hear from our great audience, um, so feel free to do so, and our team will collect them for the next episode. So one of these um, I wanted to talk about was the, the recent launch of your top systems of 2024, which we talked about a little bit on last week's episode. So if you haven't um, heard that list, highly recommend going to last week's episode and, and kind of uh, referencing that. But this question is directly related to what is the best resource for learning these specific systems in an unbiased way? Well, that's a great question. And uh I don't know that I have a good answer because I don't know that there are good options for, for learning the systems um, in an unbiased way. Um, obviously, if you go to get certified in any one of these systems, you're going to get sort of that one-dimensional, one-sided uh, approach, which is understandable. That's why you're going to that training. Uh, but as far as a broad overview, um, you know, there's not a lot of resources out there, unfortunately, that that would sort of dive into the pros and cons and strengths and advantages of different systems. That's why part of why we started putting out that sort of content, that unbiased content for the community. So obviously, you know, I, our YouTube channels are meant to 
address that deficiency in the market. And then, you know, we offer as a company, we offer uh, training and conferences that that will help um, provide some of that unbiased overview of different systems. One of which is the Digital Stratosphere Conference that's coming up in October of this year in Denver, Colorado. Um, at that Stratosphere Conference, uh, one of the topics we cover is how to select the right software and sort of a uh, overview of some of the systems in the marketplace. That's one of the topics we'll cover. One of many topics we'll cover at that Digital Stratosphere Conference. But those are a couple of things that come to mind, and uh, maybe you can tell us how to register for that event, uh, Kyler, just for those that might want to use that as a way to to learn about some of the systems in the market. Most definitely, that's a a great uh, area in which to not only learn about systems, but just to learn about the holistic ERP or implementation approach. Um, lots of great speakers. Definitely check out the agenda. You can go to stratosphere2023.com to view the the living breathing agenda. We're constantly adding new speakers, um, and you can register on that page as well. We have a a day pass to listen to all of the keynotes, and then we also have a VIP ticket that gives you full access to Eric. Um, and if you are joining post event, um, which we have a lot of listeners that might pick up these episodes later in the in the year after the event, we do have them available for replay always um, for um, a ticket price. So so those are great options to register for that. We do have a ground control promo of Strat 20 um, that you can register and receive 20 percent off your ticket. So. Um, be sure to do that. The link is also listed below in the description if you'd like to take a look that way. Hope to see everyone there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, a uh, shameless plug for the link in the description, but if you actually pre-register for our 2024 um, Digital Enterprise Operations Report, um, you can actually see that top 10 list in actual written format, but also pre-register to get more information about the actual 2024 report that will be released in the coming weeks. So that's a great opportunity and learning resource if you are really interested in kind of digging in into these systems and and really the the overall um, meat of that content. So highly recommend that as well. Absolutely. Well, great question. Definitely. Um, let's go. This is kind of a silly question um, that I wanted to bring because it made me laugh out loud. Um, this person on your YouTube channel said, wow, what great content, Eric. Um, I love all your videos. Quick question. What brand of shirts do you typically wear? Because that is a crisp shirt. I know how hard it is to keep your shirt looking nice for a long day. Thanks. Appreciate the insight. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I should... Uh... That just made me realize between that and the fact that I'm drinking a, uh, I'm drinking a monster. People have commented on the fact that I drink monster energy drinks a lot. I should probably approach monster and the manufacturer of the shirts. I prefer to be yeah. a, a sponsor of the show. Uh, we don't have a sponsor of the show, by the way, but, um, maybe someday we will, um, just keeping yeah. it tech agnostic, but also having uh, sponsors like that. Um, I don't know what shirt they're referring to. I usually wear two types of shirts today. I happen to be wearing a Brooks brothers wrinkle free yeah. or, um, Ooh. Yeah, wrinkle-free uh, shirt. Brooks Brothers, in my opinion, has has the best dress shirts. But it's summer months. I don't know if it was a summer episode, but I wear a lot of short sleeve polo shirts there from Lululemon, which uh, is people. I used to make fun of guys that shopped at Lululemon. If you're not familiar with the brand, it's started off as like a women's athletic brand, but they've since diversified into men's. And I used to make fun of my friends that would wear a Lulu until I bought a Lululemon shirt and I realized I loved them. So. Um, it's probably either Brooks Brothers or Lululemon. Those are the two that I wear the most. Yeah, it's the threat of the gods. Absolutely. Well, um, <laughs> hopefully that helped. You didn't know you were going to get style tips today, but here we are. So we do. I, I may be either the first or the last person. I'm not sure. My wife would say I'm the last person you should be taking uh, fashion advice from, but I think I've got decent fashion sense, but you know, I'm biased. So yeah, whatever. absolutely. <laughs> and, and Kelly Kimberling has an excellent sense of fashion. So it's hard to compare to that. So I mean, compared to her, everyone has bad fashion sense. Exactly. So it's, I mean, so I, I sort of disregard, I take that with a grain of salt when she tells me I don't have any fashion sense. <laughs> Well, good. Well, good. Always fun to hear kind of lifestyle uh, questions here too. And if you do have thoughts about Lululemon versus Brooks Brothers, please put that in the comments so we can collect that data around that analysis. So that that um, I'm sure will be a vigorous conversation. <laughs> I know. Okay. This is actually a really good one. This comes from us talking in previous episodes about a large Oracle failure, which they were moving this business, which was a large global entity, was moving from SAP S4 HANA to Oracle. And that's kind of a, you know, a bigger move uh, and less heard of in the industry. So this question is, why do large organizations implement their system in chunks? 
it really provides more opportunity to fail, which it seems like they usually do. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, it, it I could see why one would think that or ask that question as far as, um, you know, why not just rip off the Band-Aid and deploy all the technology you're going to deploy all at once. And I guess I what I'd say is it there's there's risks on both sides of the argument. They're just different types of risks. So on one hand, the risk you're identifying is anytime you have more of an interim phased approach to rolling out technology, the risk there is that it, you lose, you're, you're deferring business value potentially. It's taking you longer to realize the business value. Um, it's also requiring a certain amount of rework because you're going to have to roll out phase one, which is presumably just a subset of the technology you're going to deploy. And then you're going to have to have interim uh, integration points to whatever legacy systems are still there, even though those legacy systems may go away. So you're adding some costs, there's some rework, there are some risks associated with that. But then you have to compare that risk and that cost with the, the cost and risk of deploying a more of a big bang approach where you deploy the technology in, you know, a, at a broader scale more quickly. And that's just a riskier proposition. I'd say the the cost might be lower in the short term, but the cost could be higher in the long term because now you're disrupting your business and you start to look at, you know, what's the risk of operational disruption or what's the cost of operational disruption and how does that cost and risk compare to the cost and risk of the incremental approach. So a lot of it is the way we help clients make that decision or navigate the the risk trade-off is really looking inward at who you are. Like, who are you as an organization? If you're a if you're a super risk adverse company and you don't deal well with change and you historically have not dealt well with change, I would say an incremental approach is probably going to be more of a fit for you, even though there are still risks. It's more aligned with who you are as a business. If you're a fast moving, uh, fast paced, newer upstart technology company or a you know a high tech enabled sort of organization that uh, just doesn't have the baggage of decades of past you know legacy systems, it might make more sense for you and it might actually be lower risk for you to to take more of a, a uh, you know, big bang approach to, to rolling out new technology. So I'd say the first thing I'd say is don't fool yourself into thinking that there are no risks or that one is lower or higher risk than the other, because they both, I would say are equal risk. Um, but one of the options is probably going to be lower risk for you as an organization. It just depends on what your, you know, what your profile is and what you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. That's that's definitely a great precursor question to, I think, your conversation with Medi too, about system architecture and, and what that looks like. Uh, so definitely stay tuned if that was your question or in, you're interested in that question. Um, I do have one more question for you today, which is kind of a follow-up to what we talked about last week about um, if an ERP implementation doesn't scare the hell out of you, then right. you shouldn't be doing this job. And we actually had one of your younger users, and I felt a little bad for featuring that other one because we did it, you know, in a lighthearted sense. But this um, user on your TikTok actually asked, I'm actually starting a new job as um, an ERP uh, implementation uh, strategist for a new company, and your videos really scare me. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way in which I could keep positive about an opportunity to do good within my organization as opposed to be scared of failure? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really good question. Um, and very intuitive too. Um, so I'd say that, first of all, I think it is important to it, just have it in the back of your mind, you know, some of the, the fear-based stuff. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you should lead with fear for sure. I agree with the, this person on that. But I think you have to be aware of where the pitfalls in minds are. Um, and then I think from there, you, you know, that should give you a certain amount of confidence that you know the risks. I think the biggest problem with implementations or digital transformations and consulting in general is that a lot of times there's a there's a, a a way of ignoring some of those those risks or some of those those fears. So I think just being aware of them, having them in the back of your mind, but then knowing that now you can be confident to move forward because you understand the risks and now you know how to navigate those risks. I think that really is the way you can kind of flip that from a fear-based um, focus to more of a confidence-based approach going forward. Yeah, definitely great advice. Kind of reframing that perception of it might say failure in the title, but really it's a playbook to be successful because you already know and have all of these 
a great piece of content of what bigger failure, traditional failure points are. So seeing it as that opportunity. Um, people like to talk about big drama-based failures, which is why um, the question earlier talked about why would you do ERP implementations in chunks when it's just kind of going to embarrass you in the industry or something like that. But there is opportunity and what a time to be alive, you know, as an ERP consultant with all kinds of new enterprise technology. So good luck to you um, and definitely keep watching Third Stage and Eric's content because that's a great opportunity to get those unbiased strategies that will ultimately make you successful. But definitely a, a very exciting congratulations on your new job. Yeah, congratulations. That's awesome. I, I think that's very cool. It's cool to see, you know, the, what people are thinking about as newer uh, employees in the in the workforce in this space. You know, I, I think it's it's interesting to hear where their heads are, and I think it's a great opportunity to have a big impact on the industry too. Because if you think about it, this industry I think is haunted by people around my age or maybe even older that are that have been doing the same thing, making the same mistakes for 20, 30, 40 years, and that's why projects fail so often and that's why there's so many problems and that's why there's so much fear you know to use your words there's so much fear uh in the market or there should be fear but i think there's an opportunity for newer younger generation type people coming into the workforce to bring a fresh set of thinking into this and i think that's what's been missing in the industry is a lot of the same group think that's been around for decades so yeah congratulations and please make an impact in the industry because it does need it <laughs> so thank you in advance for that yeah. And during the holiday period, we'll have to do an episode on like the the spirits of ERP past or something like that. So we can you know, Ooh, cleanse that or something like that. <laughs> but um, I like it. Yes. Speaking of that um, question, I think it's a great kind of segue into our hot topics because these are a lot of not only our advice, but other advice from the industry when you look at these types of failures that you can garner those nuggets of how you're going to be successful with your implementation or your new job if you're a younger employee or even a seasoned CIO. It's a great opportunity to kind of go back to the basics and see what the conversation is. So I know you want to kind of get to those and break them down um, here with me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we look forward to it. We've got a couple uh, hot topics we'll get to here today. One is... Um, starting with a IT infrastructure failure case study, but but pivoting quickly into what are the steps for successful digital transformation. I think back to the person that asked the question about how do we not be too scared about this stuff and how can we be confident and feel good about what we're doing? Um, that's really the way we'll frame the failure case study here in a moment is to talk about what you know the contrast to that is and what you can do, be, what you can do to be successful. And then we'll also uh, get into the blueprint for an automation mindset. We'll cover that here in just a moment as well. And then later in the show, after our hot topic segment, we'll have a conversation around enterprise architecture in selection and implementation. So we'll talk about some of the stuff we just were talking about around uh, best of breed approaches versus single ERP, and um, you know, do you how how do you phase the rollout of new technologies? What do you do with the old technologies? How do you decommission those old systems? Um, how do you integrate systems? All that stuff we're going to get into with the enterprise architecture discussion that we'll have later in the show with Mehdi Yaftahi from uh, Technology Evaluation Center. So he'll be on the show later today. And by the way, uh, Mehdi will also be co-presenting with me and co-sponsoring the uh, Digital Stratosphere event that we were telling you about. That's uh, October 4th through the 6th in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about it at stratosphere2023.com. And then later in the show, we're gonna play you a couple video clips. One is how to simplify digital transformation and the other is how ERP influences business costs. We're gonna play you those clips from our YouTube channels and unpack those and bring those to life a little bit. So stick around for that. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. 
You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. Thank you for being here today. And uh, excited for some hot topics you've got in store for us here today, Kyler. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to kind of dig into these. So let's start with kind of the Southwest Airlines infrastructure failure and go into kind of what takeaways we can take from that to look strategically at our implementation. So to to set the stage of what happened last year in 2022, um, we as U.S. travelers, and, and it actually um, had a ripple effect across the globe. Uh, we witnessed the consequences of an IT and application stagnation or infrastructure failure. And this actually happened December 21st through the 26th, so some of the highest volume, and we'll talk about why that's important. Southwest Airlines actually had to cancel 70% of its flights, amounting to more than 2,500 cancellations, a very significant um, strands, people being stranded. So obviously this was peak holiday travel and their point to point traveling system and legacy software, which teetered on the lines of kind of it's functioning, it's not functioning for many years, it finally came crashing down. And the company actually reported a loss of 220 million in the final three months of 2022 and estimates another 350 million impact in its four, first quarter of 2023, not to mention the loss of thousands of customers moving forward. So what can we learn from this breakdown? And if you haven't seen Eric's video on this breakdown, he really goes into point to point of what that looks like, why a lot of larger um, companies limp along with legacy systems that can't handle that high volume or when it comes to a big issue, really fail. So there's there's three steps that this study kind of outlines um, to look at that. One is develop an organizational mindset open to change and growth. We talk a lot about that, but I think number two is really what I want to dig into you today um, with you today, Eric, is learn the best ways to measure success for a company. And really what this looks at is on those health checks when Southwest Airlines was looking at our legacy system, they had the wrong metrics to ensure success. They didn't have scenario building. If they had a large failure, or a huge um, volume increase on the latter half of COVID and travel um, increases. So what are those short terms and long term goals that you should be measuring? How will we know if we successfully executed our business strategy? Where will we need to go next and how will we get there? So really understanding those KPIs that are critical to measuring success, not kind of is it working, but is it optimized? So that's what I wanted to get your feedback on, knowing this case study, knowing it well, you've broken it down, done an analysis around it. Were they measuring really the wrong way? And does that happen frequently in large companies limping along on a legacy system? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think they do. I think too often organizations, uh, I'll, I'll actually take it one step further than than what you said. I mean, you, you asked if they measure the wrong things. What I would say is a lot of times they're measuring, they're not measuring anything at all. Um, and so I think that's the key thing is to, first of all, to recognize how important it is that to measure business value and to have a clear sense of what your expected business benefits are. Um, and really the, the business measures should be sort of three tiers that you, know, you sort of lump them into. One of them is your your traditional implementation time and cost and that sort of thing. As far as did we implement what we expected on time, on cost, and or, or under budget, um, that's the first thing. And and I think most organizations intuitively know that. In fact, they they uh, too often myopically focus just on that bucket. But then the other two buckets are even more important. The second bucket is what's the operational disruption or how do, how does the in the short term how does this implementation affect our business and what i say affect the business i'm talking about negative benefits here how do we minimize those negative business benefits of operational disruption of not being able to close the books not being able to ship products not being able to run payroll um, in the case of southwest airlines you know they weren't able to fulfill basic customer experience and customer expectations uh, because of breakdowns in their technology. So there's a negative business benefit associated with that. We don't want to ever want to talk about that because we're all focused on the positives and the, you know, the potential upside, but back to the, you know, the opening segment, the question, the audience questions what that last question from the person saying, Hey, how can we be less negative about this stuff? We have to understand that technology introduces disruption and risk to an organization. We have to figure out what are we going to do to mitigate and minimize that negative business benefit? So that's the second bucket. 
then then the third bucket, which is I think what you're alluding to, Kyler, is that longer term, higher business value. How are we going to get the business benefits? How are we going to optimize business benefits longer term? And spoiler alert, you don't get those benefits overnight and you don't go get those benefits unless you focus on them. And too often project teams will declare victory at the time of go live. They'll pray, you know, they'll pray to the gods above that there isn't too bad of a negative impact to the business. And then they'll hope that longer term, or they'll assume that longer term, those higher value business benefits are going to uh, materialize. But it's not going to happen. It, it just doesn't happen unless you go back and you fine tune and optimize post implementation. And post implementation too often is focused on let's just stabilize things, let's get everyone semi comfortable, and then we'll move on to the next phase of the project, or we'll just go back to our day jobs and call, you know, declare victory on the on the project. So I think the key here is to spend that incremental, that tiny little extra bit of time and money and focus on optimizing business benefits. It has a huge amount of value on, on the, the the longer term potential business benefits as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say if you are interested in kind of digging into this very complex subject, because it really is, it has lots of layers, right? I would highly recommend um, investing in Eric's new book, The Final Countdown. Um, it really goes through this step-by-step -step in each chapter. I know I took notes on on each side of the, the book um, of how to kind of pull out what's best for your organization. So this is a very complex, hot topic. And really, as you said, as you always say, kind of it depends for the organizational needs. So if you kind of want a playbook to walk through that, highly recommend The Final Countdown. It is available on Amazon and congrats on getting on the bestsellers list. Um, Eric, that's very exciting. Uh, yeah, so it's linked, it's linked below here. Um, and that kind of walks you through chapter by chapter. So if I had to think of all of our resources here at Third Stage, and this is a big complex question, I would definitely use Final Countdown as kind of a play by play, piece by piece of those you know three um, pillars of uh, strategies that you go through the people, process, and technology. Absolutely. And yeah, I've, I've got a copy of the book right here. Just had coincidentally, uh, it's, it's my favorite read at the moment. The Final Countdown, if you just go to thefinalcountdown.com, it'll take you directly to the um, to the uh, page where you can learn about the book and you can also order it there on Amazon as well. So thefinalcountdown.com is where you can order the book. So thank you for the, the shameless plug there, Kyler. <laughs> and truly, I do say that as I, I always try and think like, what is the you know homework or the next step that we can give our audience in these questions? Because sometimes it really does depend. Um, and in that book really is going to take you step by step of what that looks like um, to avoid those failures, to avoid a legacy system, because a legacy system failure, because we understand why a lot of times that spend is something that's really a hard sell to a board of directors or something like that. If you are a larger global complex organization like like Southwest Airlines, um, but it also might lead to a huge embarrassing downfall that not only loses you incremental dollars, but also loses you brand, you know, overall affinity in the marketplace and customers. And that's really, that hurts for a long time. Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, good. Well, let's um, move on to our, our next article, which is actually an, another book that's kind of similar to yours, um, but in a, a different way. It's it's called uh, The Blueprint for New Automation Mindset. And really this kind of talks about the concept of anti-fragility, which I know everyone's gonna love that buzzword, but I promise we'll break it down. We don't have to say it, but you guys know I'm gonna say it. So um, it's, it's actually a book that was um, published by some strategic advisors in this space and um, talks about the elements of a new mindset. And it goes really well with the final countdown. The final countdown is more strategic. This is more kind of innovation forward thinking when it comes to what that looks like. So they talk about three key questions. And I kind of want to read you the questions because they're in an interesting format and then get your feedback on them. So I'm going to read all three to you and then I'm going to let you kind of um, talk through them. So okay. they they talk about systems or task thinking. And this is really incremental improvements in productivity through optimizing discrete app applications and tasks is really tunnel vision and leads to work pileups. System thinking really orientates towards the people strategy and technology, like we were just talking about the final countdown covers, holistically towards business vision. So what do you think, systems or task thinking? 
And, and sorry, before you answer, I want the audience to get involved too. So if you can put in the co comments your thoughts, systems, or task thinking. Um, so now I'll let you answer, I promise. No, thank you for that because now I can stall a little bit and just wait and yeah. see all the audience answers and then I'll, <laughs> I'll kind of piggyback on what they say. Um, no, but I, I would say, you know, I think both are important, but I think systems is probably more important if you had to pick one, you know, that you're going to focus on or start with. Um, just because you're looking at sort of the the broader end-to-end -end systems is the way I interpret that. And so, you know, looking at, you know, what is our future state end-to-end -end workflows or, or sort of general operating model, what's that going to look like? And then the, the task stuff, though, that is important. I think that becomes more important tactical, tactically as you get into implementation and certainly as you get into change management and from a people, the human perspective, that task piece of it is going to be even more important, it becomes more important as the project evolves because that's how most humans think. They think about their specific tasks within the broader system. So you do have to address both, but I'd say if you're gonna pick one that's more important they, and definitely the one you wanna start with, I'd say it'd be the more holistic, uh, broader view of, of the overall systems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think both are important. Of course, the consultant and the independent consultant in me wants to be like, absolutely both. So, um, it but depends, hashtag. I know, right? <laughs> right. Hashtag it depends. <laughs> yep. Um, so, and then there's another one that's embrace change or fear of breaking things. And I think we can all kind of talk about what that means. That's the anti-fragility um, piece of that. But the one I actually wanted to ask you about um, as we wrap up our hot topics today are empower a team or empower specialists. So this one looks at despite all the challenges it brings, generative AI specifically, perhaps the ultimate no cold tool. Um, which if you don't know about generative AI, definitely head over to our YouTube channel or Eric's YouTube channel and, and you can kind of break it down. What that implies is dramatic or um, democratization, I should say. So granted, guardrails will be needed, but it's an opportunity is created all talent members of a team to have a hand in digital transformation, not just IT specialists. So this one was kind of hard for me to to swallow because the you know the quality assurance and, and the risk mitigation piece of that just throwing generative AI at tools or um, resources that might not know like the importance of the guardrails around it is kind of scary to me. But I thought I'd ask what you thought about that kind of new frontier of empowering um, using AI features or or resources that might not be as technically focused in the digital transformation, utilizing the AI tool. Yeah, well, I think it, it um, as we'll get into in our in our discussion with Mehdi, as we talk about enterprise architecture, one of the things that's really important to, to uh, focus on and define, and that's this is something I wanna ask Mehdi here in a moment, is I wanna, you know, I wanna ask him about that future state definition, because I think that's a big part of, of what's important, not just for enterprise architecture, which we're gonna talk about with him, but to your point about artificial intelligence and other sorts of emerging technologies, you want to have that future state vision of how you're going to use that technology. So in other words, we're not just deploying technology for technology's sake and rolling out AI because everyone's using AI. So, you know, if we're, we're all using ChatGPT at home, so why don't we introduce AI to the business? That only makes sense if you can clearly define how AI is going to benefit the business and how we as individual users of the system are going to leverage AI. So I think that future state vision and and clarity in articulation is really important more than anything is just defining what what that's going to look like and how those technologies are going to be used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely something that involves a lot of guardrails and quality assurance and governance. Um, so I think, uh, like you said, it kind of sets the stage, both of these articles and hot topics and a lot of the questions for your conversation with Medi, which I'm excited to hear kind of in this digital format, but also at Stratosphere, our event on October 4th through 6th here in Denver. Um, if you haven't looked at that link or looked at the agenda or Medi's kind of talking points there or TEC in general, um, definitely check out the link below. Uh, you can also go to stratosphere2023.com. Absolutely. And use the... Uh... The promo code STRAT20, S-T-R-A-T-2-0, to get 20% off the, uh, the the conference passes. That That's uh, a code that the listeners here can use today. And uh, Mehdi will be one of the many speakers, along with me and others, at Stratosphere 2023. Um, so we're excited to have him on the show here to talk about uh, enterprise architecture in software selection. So that'll be a great topic we'll get to. And then after Mehdi's uh, discussion, we'll get into 
how to simplify digital transformation and how ERP influences business costs. So we'll get to that, both of those topics after the conversation here with Mehdi. Um, but first we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out there. I'm excited for our next guest. He's actually a first time guest on the show. Uh, we have never had this guest or this topic, I should say. So the topic and the guest are both new first timers on the show, but for certainly uh, our guest is not a first timer in the industry. He's been around for a long time. He's been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is Mehdi Aftahi from Technology Evaluation Centers, aka TEC, I'm here to talk about enterprise architecture in selection and implementation. All that being said, Mehdi, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and I'm excited to have this conversation. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you here today. We've we've known each other for quite some time in the industry. We've been in the same circles for quite some time, but this is our first time uh, together on this podcast, so uh, thank you for being here today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump into the, the topic at hand here. Tell us about yourself, and if you don't mind, tell us about uh, technology evaluation centers as well. Sure. Uh, I'll talk about technology evaluation centers first and uh, my role in it. Uh, technology evaluation center is a software selection consulting advisory firm. Uh, we are focusing on um, helping our client in uh, evaluation and selection of applications for their enterprise, ERPs and CRMs and uh, applications such as that. Um, one thing about our services is that we are totally impartial, agnostic, and uh, um, we, we care about the, um, the, the selecting the right software and uh, uh, we don't take any uh, you know, commissions or take any sides from the vendors. Um, we have a software platform uh, that allows us to evaluate and, um, you know, compare different applications is available online and, um, you know, many uh, partners and uh, vendors and uh, end users are actually able to use that to define their uh, requirements online and then get the information from the vendors and to be able to see which one fits their requirements the best. So that's about uh, technology evaluation centers. Um, and uh, my role as a CTO, I uh, also, uh, you know, on top of the technologies that I'm in charge of, I also manage the consulting uh, practice that we have, which is including the selections and the enterprise architecture projects and uh, managing partners and so on. Great. And in it's, uh, we, we have an interesting relationship, our two companies, because on paper, we should be mortal enemies, should we not? I mean, we should be, we're competitors, we should be uh, yeah. throwing each other's throats, but we found a way to collaborate yeah. in this uh, industry instead. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting uh, analogy, but we are not enemies for sure. Uh, we, we believe in, I think you, you believe in the same thing. Uh, uh, there is enough business out there for all of us first. Uh, then uh, we have something, I think that we can uh, make uh, public, make it public and uh, expose it to more consultants uh, such as yourselves. So 
you can benefit from it. And I don't think that you're taking away any business from us by using our technology. And the contrary, I think that by promoting good uh, good knowledge and good uh, information out there, uh, we're going to have more successful uh, projects and more business for you, more business for us. And that's uh, that's our uh, you know motivation uh, behind our partnership, right? So that's right. that's what we are we set out to do. It's now it's like we're getting into fourth or fifth year of our relationship. I, I think so. It's yeah, it was right right after we started third stage. That was one of the first. Yeah. I think it was the first partnership we forged was with we with you guys with TEC. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. Uh, we license your technology. We use it as part of our consulting offering. Obviously, it's your technology, and and you you know you have your own clients. We have our clients. Sometimes we compete. We still compete yeah. sometimes, but it's uh, more often than not that we're complementing yeah. each other. Um, yeah, for so, sure. Well, for good sure. to have you here. This this should be a good perspective, being that we both do similar sorts of things and yeah. see similar sorts of decision processes yeah. and this topic in particular um before we jump into it here um this topic in particular is something that you're going to be um presenting at our upcoming uh, stratosphere conference and i'm going to pop up a little um little text here that tells you a little bit more about it but you and i so tec in third stage as well as two other sponsors taf law and avero advisors um there's four of us that are co-sponsoring this event in october uh in denver colorado um, it's a conference, it's a three-day conference with Medi, myself, and about a dozen other speakers that'll be there, um, both from our companies as well as other companies as well. Um, you can learn more about that event by going to stratosphere2023.com. But you're going to be at that event speaking about this topic here today, although maybe in a okay. little bit more of a formal presentation style, whereas today we're going to have more of an informal conversation. Um, so this will be a similar topic as to what you'll cover at Stratosphere in October. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm very excited to 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 be there and uh, to meet again with uh, with your team and um, you know to exchange some information with uh, with, with uh, participants in this uh, very uh, you know the last time we we went to the stratosphere it was right before covid struck so in in san yeah. diego i, I right. think that that was my last uh, uh, you know trip before covid but uh, since then uh, you know, we, we have done a lot together, but not in person and not in uh, in these kinds of events. So I'm very excited to be there. And uh, for sure, it's going to be a, a hopefully a, a very good informative session for everybody. Right. And I will be talking about this topic. And uh, as, as you mentioned, it's going to be a little bit more formal presentation and uh, uh, I'm probably going to be spending, in, in, you know, time there to answer any specific questions from anybody there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we have a special uh, discount code for our listeners here today. If, I'm going to pop it here on the screen, but it's STRAT20, S-T-R-A-T-20. That's a promotional code you can use to get a 20% discount. Um, on the conference passes. So if you go to stratosphere2023.com, you can see the whole agenda. You can see what Medi is going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about, what other speakers are going to talk about. You can see all the live entertainment and peer networking opportunities, um, great educational and networking um, opportunities. So I encourage you to join. And if you use this code I have in front of you, STRAT20, you can get a 20% discount on the pass. So that's the code you would use when you go to check out or when you go to purchase your pass. Um, you can get that uh, discount. We also have a VIP level pass too that gives us more it gives you more access to people like Medi and myself and, and uh, in smaller groups and some smaller breakout sessions that are just for VIP uh, pass holders. So be sure to check that out as well. Again, go to stratosphere2023.com, promo code STRAT20 um, to get 20% off. So I'll, I'll pop that up again later throughout the conversation here today um, as we as we go, just as a reminder. But in the meantime, I want to sort of jump to the audience here and thank everyone who who chimed in on where they're joining from today. You can see if we look at the various streams here, we've got people from all over the world, uh, ranging from Denver, Colorado to London, Minneapolis, Minnesota, The Hague, Stone Lake, Wisconsin, Wyndham, North Carolina, Montana, Clovis, California, Netherlands, uh, New York City, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, East Germany. So a lot of a lot of people from all over the world. So thank you for being here today from wherever you're joining from um, here today. And you, I don't know if you mentioned this, uh, Mehdi, but you are in uh, Canada, is that correct? Yes, uh, we are in Montreal, Canada, and uh, our, our office uh, is, virtual office, I guess, is at our homes, but 
our headquarters in the south shore of Montreal. Um, and um, although we are from Canada, uh, we work globally. We work uh, throughout the world. We have projects in Far East, in Europe, uh, South America, and uh, of course, the United States and Canada. So, um, you know, it's good to have the audience from all over the world. And it's, it's a topic that is not just for North America, this, this specific topic. And in general, software selection is very challenging for everybody. And uh, it's good to have everybody uh, chiming in and uh, listening in. So hopefully we can uh, have some uh, benefits uh, to the audience uh, through these kinds of discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start there with then what what it, the topic today is obviously enterprise architecture and how it fits yeah. into a software selection and implementation process. But what if you sort of back up and just start with the real basics here, what what exactly is enterprise architecture? Uh, enterprise architecture refers to the uh, the IT or information technology structure that you have in place that uh, at any time has to be able to cover your business requirements and business needs. So when you are talking about uh, any any business, you have a series of business processes that are handled through various uh, means, right? Could be uh, in the old days, it would be manual forms or Excel or anything else. Uh, nowadays, uh, we try to put everything in digital format and uh, uh, make them connect and flow through the systems. So these systems that we are talking about, it could be desperate systems or it could be disjointed systems or it could be anything that the company evolved with. Uh, at any given time, you have an architecture that serves the company in, pro in providing those business processes. So uh, by defining the architecture, what we mean is to draw the uh, the blueprint of what that system is today. And hopefully you can, you know, improve it, uh, find the gaps, find the holes where the business processes do not connect, they don't talk to each other, and where there are still manual or Excel processes involved. So that is the, the basic promise of, or the definition of an ar enterprise architecture. It's like a uh, the blueprint of a, a building or, a, a, you know, a, a something that you're trying to build. This is the blueprint of your information technology within any organization. They, they must have it. And uh, it's very interesting that in many organizations that we go for, uh, there is no such a thing. Like they don't know all the different moving parts or they don't know all the systems that are actually in, in involved in their business processes. It's a very good exercise to start with, to just understand what you're dealing with before even going to about improving or replacing or ripping and replacing some of those systems, you have to know where you start from. And enterprise architecture in a, in, as a definition is what is the information technology systems or platforms that you're currently using and what they do, how they talk to each other, what business processes they cover, and uh, in general, where the parameters of those, uh, or not the parameters, like the the uh, the scope of those applications or platforms are. Right, right. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from the audience, you know, what your thoughts are on, are on enterprise architecture. Is it something you're familiar with? Have you addressed EA or enterprise architecture in the past, I'd love to hear from the audience, just any comments or thoughts you have around just the general concept of, of enterprise architecture. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Centers talking about enterprise architecture in selection and implementation of new technology. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. I'm Kyler Cheatham from Third Stage Consulting Group, and I wanted to take a minute to personally invite you to our Stratosphere 2023 in-person event on October 4th through 6th in Denver, Colorado. We are super pumped to bring this event back in person after COVID 
It will actually be the first time in three years that we've done an in-person stratosphere. And we're so excited to bring you top thought leadership and tactical project strategies throughout this important event. We'll not only feature keynotes from top speakers in the industry, but also interactive workshops where you can pick your area of expertise that you wanna get information on regarding your digital transformation project. You can head to stratosphere2023.com to see our full agenda and our jam-packed excitement for the event. We also are offering a VIP ticket this year, which gives you full access to Eric, as well as a signed copy of his new book. So I hope to see you there and meet you in person in Denver. If you have any questions, again, you can reach out to me directly at kyler.cheatham at thirdstage-consulting.com and I'll see you in Denver. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So thank you for being here today. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Center is talking about enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation. Let's jump back into the conversation. Um, here's a question from, from Kyler that I think is, is a good one. Kyler on LinkedIn, who says, what comes first, selection, the software selection, or system architecture? So I guess it maybe begs a broader question of where and how does enterprise architecture fit into the entire life cycle of software selection, evaluation, and implementation. Exactly. So it's it's very interesting because when you're talking about uh, a problem within it, within the organization, that's where the, it, it's a trigger for change, right? Mm -hmm. There is a problem. There is a business need. There is a there is a business process that is not working properly, or you don't have the right systems. So companies tend to just jump into the technologies. Okay, let's go buy this software. So, and that's where the, the, the you know, if you're, if you're just going about buying the software, you're just going to buy the software. You're going to try to fit it in within your current architecture or current systems. There's going to be a chaos. There's going to be uh, problems going forward. So in our opinion, uh, enterprise architecture is the first step of any software selection process. So you have to, as I said before, you have to know where the, uh, the problems are, where the systems are, uh, which systems are working, which systems are not working properly, and know where your, uh, you know, the, 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 the scope is before jumping into a selection project or an evaluation project. For me, the, uh, if, if you're trying to, for example, renovate your, uh, your kitchen or your, your, your house, you have to do some you know, uh, research in terms of where you're going to move the walls or things like that. So, but you need to know where they are, where things are, where the roof is or connected or where there's bearing walls or things like that. So you do that, but when you're doing the architecture for your enterprise, uh, you need to do the same thing. You, you cannot just rip apart systems because they're going to have uh, issues later on, or you have to know which systems are going to be replaced at which point and which systems are going to be integrated into the, to the new system that you are per, you're, you're buying or implementing. Yeah, it's, it seems like I'm curious to hear your feedback on this, Mehdi, or if you see the same phenomena with your clients. But with our client base, a lot of times we we find that there's a mentality of we're not going to worry about architecture yet because we're, we're going to get rid of our current architecture. So the current state doesn't matter and we're going to focus on the future state, but we don't know what the software is yet. So we're not we're not going to worry about enterprise architecture until we've selected the software. And yeah. then, by the way, the software vendor, especially if they're selling us a single ERP system, they're probably going to handle that for us. So we're not going to worry too much about enterprise architecture right now. Is that something you see in the, in the market? And if so, how do you, what, yeah. what's your message to the, to that? So, yeah, that, that's a very good topic. Like we are not focusing on the current, current system. So we need to know where the current systems are in order for us to determine where the gaps are, where the problem areas are, where the bottlenecks are. And then the, the, the most important part of the enterprise architecture review is the redesign and re-architecture of the new system. So 
we are doing this. It's just, as I said in the past for the, you know, renovation, you're coming up with a blueprint of the new design. That is where the important stuff is. So mm -hmm. it's not about, you know, documenting what you have. That's of obviously the starting point, but then you have to make that change. Say, okay, this is our current state and this is our future state. So you need to have that architecture, uh, future architecture in, in, in sight and say, so, okay, this is where our ideal solution or architecture is going to be. And then for that architecture, just try to fit the vendors that or projects, define projects that gives you that future architecture. And I, I think you, 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 you just put a, uh, you just uh, touched on a very specific topic that vendors can do it as well. Of course, vendors will eventually have to design the architecture around their own software. But that's where the problem might really lie because they're going to put their software in the middle and they try to put pieces around it to fit their software and not necessarily uh, put your business processes and business requirements first and then try to fit the software to it. That's that's the difference of making uh, the or, or doing the architecture review and design first uh, and then selection. And of course, there is a huge, uh, uh, you know, cost uh, savings if you do it ahead of time. Uh, typically, when you do this kind of work with vendors, their consultants and the depending on their experience and which vendor you're going to go for, it's going to be multiple uh, uh, you know, in the order of, um, you know, um, multiple uh, orders in terms of covering that cost of the consulting with consultants such as yourselves or our company and advisory firms. So uh, the cost of implementors, uh, which they're going to charge you to do this work, is going to be much higher than uh, you doing it. And of course, they're going to not do this the, the, the right way for agnostic uh, view of doing the architecture for you. Right. Right. They're You're centering their software in the middle and everything has to fit their software as opposed to making sure that the, your business processes are uh, uh, the, the important thing in there. Right. Here's a interesting uh, comment that I think triggers a, another question in my mind here. Uh, this is from Nicholas on LinkedIn. And Nicholas says, this is a challenge if your ERP is SAP or Infor. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I don't necessarily want to pick on specific vendors, but if you look at SAP, Infor, Oracle is the same way, even Microsoft, a lot of these big software vendors have built their ERP systems by acquiring other systems and kind of piecing together almost a best of breed model, but they just happen to be the same software vendors. So they call it fully integrated ERP. But the point is, is even when you buy what you think is a integrated ERP system from a big software vendor, you still really are getting multiple modules, in some cases, multiple systems that need to be tied together. So, you know, what would you say to that as far as how enterprise is enterprise architecture any more or less important if you're looking at a single ERP vendor or no. best of breed model or is it what are no. your thoughts? Yeah, actually, that's a that's also a very interesting question. Our goal typically in when we are doing the enterprise architecture redesign for a company is to reduce the total number of systems they have. So ideally, we want to end up with one system. Hmm. This is our goal. And that's what we are aiming for. Uh, but by doing the enterprise architecture properly, we see the different parameters that are in play in getting that single system in place, which is the cost of implementation, the cost of buying and acquiring all of those modules, as you mentioned, and also how difficult it is to uh, put everything under single system. Now, in many cases, it is possible. In some cases, it might be more logical and more economical to have a, 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 a core ERP coupled with 
niche applications or niche functionality that are bolt on or added to the core system. Uh, the examples that you mentioned, like SAP or Infor, we had projects where, you know, getting SAP or, uh, you know, other applications covered the entire scope of the business processes could cost double or triple the, uh, the cost of limiting the functionality and adding a bolt-on to it. So that is the promise of uh, the, or what some of the benefits of the enterprise architecture and knowing what you're getting yourself into before, uh, you know, getting into the negotiations with the vendors. Yeah. And knowing exactly what, what you're getting and what systems you're replacing. And even if you start to look at like the interim systems, because you, you, even if you have a single ERP system or a core suite of products, they're going to replace a multitude of other systems. You're not going to replace those systems overnight. You're not going to just shut them off exactly. and then switch over. You're going to have these interim EA strategies as well. How do you, how do you handle that in the, inter, in the interim typically, or is that something you see where, you know, yeah, yeah exactly. Go so away, but, so one of the benefits of doing the enterprise architecture the way we are proposing it to do is that uh, we're going to probably, uh, not probably, uh, we, we are going to provide a roadmap for the implementation and getting you from where you are to where the ideal to be state of your architecture is. And that how to go from step one to the final stage which is the roadmap, you can define multiple projects in there. So it could be the uh, same ERP in different phases of implementation where you're going to rip and replace partially some of the systems that you have in place and replace it with the ERP or having multiple applications uh, working together to get you to your future state. So that's that roadmap is one of the outcomes of uh, doing a proper uh, enterprise architecture design, which defines uh, the scope of the projects and which projects you're going to be tackling first, and the timing, the phasing of each of these projects. And uh, that roadmap and eventually your what we call it, the IT uh, or architect, uh, sorry, the enterprise um, master plan is the the ideal situation where you're going to go for. And uh, by doing the enterprise architecture, you get the commitment from all the stakeholders within your organization to agree on uh, the, uh, the, the future state of your platforms. And the road to it is going to be uh, basically defined by the roadmap that you're doing. Yeah, and that's a it's a great point. And something that you as an organization, not not the software vendor, but you as an organization have to decide those things. Because you know, it's easy for a software vendor, even you or I, Mehdi, it's easy for us to turn to a CIO and say, Yeah, just shut off all those old systems and yeah. turn on the new one and call it good. I mean, that's that's a high risk uh, sort of scenario that you have to decide as an organization what the right you know, is it, is it an incremental uh, rollout or is it a more aggressive uh, schedule? But regardless, you're typically going to have these interim steps where you've got the interim systems that are eventually going to go away, but they're not going away overnight. So you end up integrating them maybe for a short period until you ultimately phase those systems out. So I think that that's part yeah, of it. For sure. The, if, if I go back to the renovation, uh, you know, analogy, you're, you, you are actually cooking in the kitchen while you're re renovating it. And most businesses are uh, functioning like that. So you cannot just rip apart the systems and replace it because then everything else will break down. So during this architecture review, we are going to find where those critical areas are, where the critical systems are. And uh, we have to come up with a, a, a methodology in terms of... Um, you know, doing the renovation, but not breaking the house down, right? So right. that's uh, that's where uh, some of the implementation failures that we see come from, because there's not enough um, research and uh, thought process in the, uh, 
you know, the effects of the implementation and how things are going to be about going. Yeah. Through. Yeah, absolutely. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Centers talking about enterprise architecture in selection and implementation of new technology. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. When fans are big, that should be small. Who can tell what magic spells we are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So thank you for being here today. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Center is talking about enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation. Let's jump back into the conversation. Here's a question from Ryan on LinkedIn. Ryan asks, how do emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, or Internet of Things influence the enterprise architecture approach to software selection and implementation? Um, so in other words, you know, these emerging technologies, whether it's AI, blockchain, IoT, or anything else, how does that all tie into this whole enterprise architecture roadmap that you're talking about? Yeah, the, 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 in terms of the, I don't think it necessarily uh, affects the architecture. You, you still need to see where those technologies fit in your organization, right? So the fact that you have IoT or AI or anything else, just because there is a, there is a good name for it, doesn't mean that you can just implement it almost everywhere in your organization. You still have to find where those technologies fit and which processes can benefit from those uh, technologies and where you draw the line in terms of, uh, you know, enabling those technologies to come in. And luckily, most software vendors are putting those technologies, embed those technologies within their application. So when you're going through the software selection, which is the next stage after the enterprise architecture, and if your requirements for those technologies are well documented, then you can evaluate the best applications that can provide you with the AI or the IoT or any other technologies, emerging technologies that fit your requirements, your fit your needs. Getting an AI where you have no use for it is, you know, in that process is, is just wasting your time and effort in terms of buying the technology and implementing it. And the way I look at it, buying these kinds of technologies is no difference than any other technologies that have evolved in the last five or 10 years, you have to have the need for it. And how do you know if you have the need? It's through the enterprise architecture and a true evaluation and selection and not being mesmerized by the demos and, uh, you know, shiny uh, presentations that software vendors often sell their software with. So you have to really know how or when I'm going to use that technology and how it actually benefits my business, you know, how it would improve uh, the product quality, the, the, uh, the, uh, the per performance of my employees uh, or saves me time or saves me money or things like that. You have to identify those ahead of time and then go for it. Of course, technology is something that, everybody is uh, excited about and uh, we want to have as many uh, new technologies in our system but it has to fit in and has to uh, you know in a, in a concert in, in a concerted effort help us achieve the 
the organization's uh, vision. Right, right, absolutely. And just as a reminder too, um, as we get to some more audience questions here, um, this topic is something we're going to dive into in more detail at our Digital Stratosphere event that uh, Medi's company and my company are both co-sponsoring. Um, it's called Digital Stratosphere. It's a technology agnostic um, conference that we're hosting October 4th through the 6th in Denver. You can learn more about it by going to stratosphere2023.com. We have the agenda. Um, although we keep adding to the agenda, we keep adding speakers and more content, but you can see how the agenda is unfolding right now at stratosphere2023.com. You can also register there. When you do register, though, uh, go use this uh, promo code called STRAT20, S-T-R-A-T-2-0, and you'll get 20% off the uh, conference pass. Again, that's STRAT20. Um, so be sure to join us there. We'd love to love to meet you in person, and uh, it'll be a fun in-person event. It's our first uh, in-person event since COVID, so we're actually really excited to um, to co-host that with you, Mehdi. Um, Thank you. So some other, uh, another question here I have, and this is one that, that I, I have for you, Mehdi, is, is what, are, what are some of the business benefits? We've talked about tactically and strategically, you know, how EA fits into a software selection or how it should. And the renovation analogy makes a lot of sense. And as far as, you know, when you're building a house, it's similar to building a technology um, yeah. rollout. But what are some of the general, you know, longer term and shorter term business benefits of enterprise architecture? Yeah, the, the, the benefits are, uh, you know, there is a lot of benefits for this exercise. And often uh, when we go through this exercise with uh, with the organizations, they see it. They, they see right away where the solutions are going to be. And uh, one of the most, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, important benefits is the alignment of information technology with business so you you basically trying to uh, at, at any given time companies evolve and the, the the information technology has its own life goes in one direction the business might change direction going here and there but it's not necessarily uh, the IT that can follow very quickly the business direction so uh, you need to at any you know, set intervals, five years, 10 years, whatever, you need to have a reset and then align your IT uh, infrastructure with your business vision and business, uh, you know, uh, goals. Um, the other benefit I could call the standardization of uh, business processes and IT uh, processes or IT applications. So we see uh, in in a lar in larger organizations that different departments at given times they go and buy different pieces of technology and they start evolving their own business processes within within their own departments and the, as the companies grow this is a, a, a bigger problem and uh, one of the benefits of the uh, doing the enterprise architecture is to figure out where these processes that are duplicated or different systems that are doing duplications are and try to standardize all of those. And of course, it comes with co tremendous cost reduction because you are now standardizing your systems, your, uh, your business processes. And uh, by doing so, you also allowing the IT to be more agile and follow your uh, your your business processes and within your organization. And of course, there is always the risk uh, and management of that risk that you can um, that you can see where the critical processes are, where there is no systems and there is no data to support it. And that's where some of the companies that we help with, um, you know, really having uh, that kind of problem where most of the critical uh, business processes are handled through Excel or other forms or disconnected from their main uh, ERP system because those critical systems evolved after the, the fact that the, the ERP was in place or the systems were designed. So these are some of the benefits. Of course, there are uh, multiple things that we can talk about uh, change management is one of them as well. So you can 
you, you, you at, 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 at uh, third stage, you guys are involved in a lot of, uh, you know, implementation and you, you see that the uh, having the, the buy-in and alignment of all the different players or stakeholders within the organization and agree on the system to go forward is a first step of the change management, right? So th this process is starting that change management process within the organization as well. So uh, it creates that, uh, you know, blueprint of the future architecture of the system where everybody agrees on and uh, hopefully they're going to have less problem later on accepting the new system. Right. Yeah. Those are, those are great benefits and, and uh, good points too, in terms of how it, how it can affect or improve your, your business, you know, shorter term and longer term. Mm -hmm. um, we, we touched on this a little bit, but I think it's worth um, maybe digging into it a little bit more here. And this is a question from Kyler on LinkedIn, but her question is how does system architecture pivot when organizations choose a best of breed approach versus a core or a single ERP system? So in other words, is the, I know we talked about that EA is important. We've already established that yeah. in this conversation that it's important in, in both cases. But how do you do you approach EA any differently in a sort of best of breed environment, which would be multiple systems that you're deploying versus deploying a single ERP system? Yeah, uh, you know when we are when we are looking at the EA and the the process of enterprise architecture review, we are looking at business processes first, right? So we we we, we don't look at the systems we look at the business processes we say okay what are the needs are where where the business processes are and then we're trying to basically cover those business processes with it it uh, platforms where they're going to enable those business processes now of course uh, we have uh, different camps within within our uh, client base where they say, okay, you know what? We have a good purchasing system. We're not going to touch that purchasing system. So that purchasing system is going to stay alone. And then we're going to put the entire ERP system around it. We, and they're going to buy a new ERP. So the approach is, as I said before, sometimes it makes sense to have something outside of the ERP because there are cost benefits. There are going to be risk issues and implementation easiness or the ease of implementation, if I can call it. But in some cases, it doesn't make sense to have that purchasing system outside of your ERP system because we can prove it that the ERP system that you're going to get is going to cover the functionality you need, for example, for that purchasing that you have. So it's, it's not one or the other. The enterprise architecture allows you to understand which systems are going to be inside of your overall one system ERP or which system do not belong there or it doesn't make sense economically or uh, technically to be included. So uh, it's not a, a one solution that we always come up with best of breed or we're going to go with one solution all the time every case is different every client is different and our goal as i said before is to reduce the number of systems that you have if it means that you're going to have one single solution and that one single solution is fully capable of providing you with the architect with the entire um, business process scope that you have so let's go for it if it doesn't make sense and you have to have a, uh, you know, a best of breed kind of solution, that is also the possibility that we truly, through a, uh, a proper enterprise architecture design, we can recommend that, recommend that to the client. But it has to make sense. It, it doesn't have to be just like, because I like this purchasing system or the HR system, we're going to keep it. It has to make both economic sense and business sense to go forward with that. Right. Yeah. Makes total sense. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Centers talking about enterprise architecture in selection and implementation of new technology. 
We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. I'm gonna leave it all out there I, uh, I'm gonna leave it all out there Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So thank you for being here today. We're here with Mehdi from Technology Evaluation Center is talking about enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation. Let's jump back into the conversation. What are some of the best ways that project teams, if they've already selected software, let's assume, and let's assume the organization in question here has not done an EA review yet. They've selected software, they're getting ready to implement, or maybe they're in the early stages of implementation. What are some of the best ways to address enterprise architecture, to start addressing enterprise architecture during an implementation? You know, that, that, that's, you know, if you've selected the, uh, the software already without doing a proper either enterprise architecture or some kind of an evaluation of your business processes and evaluation or comparison of the different applications to fit that uh, business process, you're going to have some issues later on. Like, of course, you're going to have uh, implementation uh, is not going to go as smooth as possible. So for us, uh, we had a couple of clients where they were in that process of implementation and they fig they found out that there's certain piece of functionality that they missed out, they didn't even include in their, uh, you know, process or mm -hmm. the software does not cover those uh, functionality. And they were just basically sold the software that, uh, you know, does not cover those business requirements. So there is never, a, I, I would say it's not ever too late to do the enterprise architecture. You can halt the project the implementation project, do an EA. And then if if you are in a, in a situation where you are in an impasse with the vendor in terms of functionality and the coverage of your business processes, then you have to do your, uh, you know, the EA and uh, maybe there is a way to save the project, maybe by adding some bolt-ons or getting some, uh, software add-ons to cover the missing functionality or, you know, maybe uh, get rid of the vendor and find another vendor that can cover the process. But, um, you know, often these kinds of projects, if they start in the wrong, uh, from a wrong place, they usually then don't end up in the right place or they, they don't end well. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like... Uh... Started as soon as possible, but better late than never at the same time. I mean, it's better. Than exactly. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the more money you put into those projects that have uh, trouble starts, uh, it's not helping. So you, you're going to lose uh, you, you're going to lose your time and your money. And uh, the sooner you do a reset, the better it is. But I'm not saying that every single project that uh you know you start without an ea is gonna fail of course you know there is a bigger risk when you uh when you don't do the proper uh, you know research up front right it's all about managing risks right yeah you mentioned uh change management earlier and it, it just sort of something you'd said just jogged this in my head though um so when you when you have dealt with 
IT groups within organizations that are defining this enterprise architecture and sort of the roadmap for decommissioning old systems and implementing yeah. new systems. Have you, do you see a sort of a resistance from the IT group, the internal IT group that's more sort of entrenched in the current state and they don't necessarily want to open their minds or they feel threatened by opening their minds to what that future state architecture looks like? Or how does, how does resistance to change factor into this if it does at all, you know, with, within the internal IT groups as it relates to this? Yeah. So the resistance to change, I think is more from, in our, in my experience, is more from the, uh, the business side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, IT is, from our experience for the client that we work with, yes, there is sometimes there are the, um, the, the people that want to, no matter what, to keep the old systems because that's what they like and they understand and it's, uh, it's, uh, they're, they're very good at handling. But um, more often we see the IT as a good uh, advocate for the change of the systems, not necessarily the business processes because they're not going to get involved in the business processes. What we see as a resistance more often is on the business side of things where the, the people are uh, resisting to the, 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 the change in the way they, they do things. And mm -hmm. that's coming from, a, from the new system. And, uh, you know, the, the only way to, to, to address that and to reduce that resistance is to get them involved in the decision. To us, getting those IT people, sorry, the business people and the IT people involved in the decision-making process from the start, from the enterprise architecture to the evaluation and selection, and later on into the entire uh, implementation process, it's the key to get that project to a successful uh, completion um the you know getting the data from the old system is something that as, as you mentioned is something that the it is usually very capable of doing and uh, most often we see that it is uh, is trying to get rid of the old systems because they are very uh, you know hard to maintain or, uh, you know, they, they like to have uh, better sim systems in place so they can have less trouble maintaining them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's uh, an interesting point. It, yeah. I guess depending on the client, you might see resistance from the business and that, that I agree is probably more common than resistance from it. Um, I just think of the occasional client we work with where you've got the person that was involved with developing the legacy homegrown system oh, yeah. 20 years Those ago. Guys. Yeah. If you ask that person for input on what that future state enterprise architecture looks like, sometimes you'll get sort of a biased view that comes at it from the perspective of how do I protect, not my turf, but how, how do you protect what I've built, you know, with, within the yeah, company? You know, they, they are, they, 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 these people, we see a lot of them, uh, at least one or two in any company that we go for and uh, depending on the strategy of the IT and the, the business uh, the business platform development kind of strategy those people are um, you know they hold the key to that system right so of course if this if you rip that system apart uh, they have nowhere to go like they, they probably have uh, the, you know protecting their their interests is is key but uh, again that's from a business point of view that doesn't make sense to get the company the company is held hostage to one person what we see often though is uh, the other way around that uh, also a problem which is the digital transformation project is given to IT as the project and say, okay, go figure out which system we're going to have. And they go do their research, sometimes very good research, and they go back to the business. Okay, this is the system. That's what you have to go. And you have to implement and restarting implementation, let's say in a month. So the business is 
caught by surprise and they have no say or they feel that they had no say in that selection. And that's where the source of all that change management uh, issues are coming from and the resistance is coming from. If the IT was in line with the business and uh, got, the in, got the business involved in that decision-making process, uh, I think they would have not uh, come up with that kind of a resistance in the future. And that's where our goal is often in our projects to make sure that the IT is involved and the business is involved and each they know their role in the evaluation and selection and the, the process that follows. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I've got a question that I know you answered, uh, I think in passing or related to another question uh, in earlier in the conversation, but I think it's worth coming back to as sort of a, a capstone summary of this entire discussion, but how do you suggest that a digital transformation project team get started on the EA work stream? I, and you've, I think you've talked about it from a couple of angles here. There's sort of the ideal Ideally, here's how you do it. And then if you haven't done that, then what's the other option? <laughs> Maybe yeah, for sure. The, the, the first thing is to, uh, for us, is to come up with the right team on the client side that knows the business. So you need to start with your champions, business champions. And of course, get the IT also involved in terms of because they're going to play a major role in identifying the systems. But we also have to uh, identify the business processes. So there are, uh, you have to put a good team together, uh, which is, which again consists of uh, the key stakeholders in terms of the business processes and people that understand the business uh, rules, the business, uh, uh, how the business works and operates and also the IT support. So once you have that team, you start doing uh, what we call it the business requirements gathering sessions. It doesn't have to be an extensive BPM or business process modeling exercise, uh, because as you mentioned before, we are gonna rip apart all those processes, replace them. So there is no need to get into those detailed uh, business process modeling, but you need to have a very good overview of the business processes and of course uh the bottlenecks the the uh the the, um, the shortcomings of the current systems and where you see improvements are going to help your business so for example as you mentioned if there is a requirements for new technologies or things that are considered as best practices for your industry, you have to be able to identify those. So that is part of our business requirements gathering process. And once you have a map of your business processes, then you have to draw the systems on top of it, current systems, which IT will help you that, okay, I'll do this process with the help of this IT or the, 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 the software. And there you find uh, areas where there are processes and there are no systems or they're already identified as this process is handled through Excel sheets or things like that. So you identify and document all of those processes and that's where you start with and that's where you can then translate those business processes into functions and features or functions requirement sets that we call them. And then from there, you can identify vendors that can satisfy those requirements. Right. Yeah. In other words, it gives you sort of a blueprint for selecting exactly. and implementing the right technology. Exactly. Uh, in addition to, you know, business processes, business requirements, all this stuff that I think we sort of intuitively know you need to do. Mm -hmm. Everyone's used to hearing about the term business requirements. And so I think that comes a little bit more naturally to organizations than thinking about that future state technical blueprint or the enterprise architecture blueprint as well. Another thing that we do and we often uh, encourages, uh, encourage people within the organizations to pay attention to is that during those interview sessions, we bring in uh, best practices and we try to educate the business uh, stakeholders with the best practices of their industry. So that's another way that 
we can insert some of that change management mentality or uh, the notion of the change that is coming in their mind. So that way, when they see the new system during the demos later on in the stage, they can connect. And, oh, that's what you meant. That's where that that process is going to be changing too. And that's what I like or that's what I don't like. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it helps you envision what that future yeah. future state's going to look like. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I appreciate you you taking the time here, Mitty. This was a great conversation. And uh, you and I were talking before the podcast uh, recording that um, this is the first time that we've covered this topic on on this podcast. So I really appreciate you being part of that and helping us un unpack it uh, in more detail. I think it's one of those one of those things, a lot like change management or other aspects of digital transformations that organizations tend to overlook or downplay. You know, exactly. they think, OK, that's you know, that's that enterprise architecture stuff. We'll figure that out once we pick the software, once we start implementing it. And I think that's a what one of the yeah. takeaways here is that's not the right approach to to addressing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I'm glad that uh, we could have this and I, I hope I hope that it was informative. And looking forward to see everybody at the uh, stratosphere. All right. Thank you, Mehdi. Great conversation and uh, looking forward to talking more about that topic as well as other topics at our Digital Stratosphere Conference in October, October 4th, 5th, and 6th in Denver, Colorado. Again, you can learn more about that conference and register for the conference at stratosphere2023.com. Again, stratosphere2023.com and use the promo code STRAT20, S-T-R-A-T-2-0 if you want to get 20% off. You don't have to use the promo code, but if you do use the promo code, you'll get 20% off the uh, the um, discount or off the, the pass fees there. And uh, there's two different tiers of passes you can uh, sign up for as well, as well, depending on how much of the conference you want to attend. And uh, you can get some uh, premier access to Medi and myself and other speakers uh, if you if you upgraded the VIP pass. But either way, check out the uh, agenda, um, some of the peer networking of opportunities and that sort of thing. Again, at stratosphere2023.com. So we're going to unpack a couple of these threads here, some interesting nuggets and takeaways from the conversation. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham, your hosts here for today, and we just had Medi on the show from TEC, Kyler, and he was talking about enterprise architecture in software selection and implementation. What were some of your takeaways from that conversation? Well, I, I love the um, focus on system architecture and the importance of things like process mapping and understanding your current technologies within the organization. And it seems like a, a really daunting process um, to really do that, especially if you're a larger organization or even sometimes smaller because you do have things like tribal knowledge or where you don't have kind of visibility into the processes. So you had mentioned why this can be a key failure point if you don't spend the time and investment and in actually looking at your current state or your system architecture and your target operating model. Well, do you feel like there's some sort of kind of fatigue that happens? Like an organization starts with the best intentions of looking at their own processes, looking at their own technologies, and they get kind of weighed down by the amounts that there are or the processes that are broken and kind of just move on saying, oh, you know, the new software really fix all of this. So it's just it's not even worth our time or resources right now. Is that kind of how that goes? Because it seems like a lot of times we talk about starting out with it but we don't actually see it to fruition and can come up with a mismatch of software for the business. Yeah, it, it is a common phenomenon that you described. And, and I'd say what 
further complicates or further contributes to that tendency to want to avoid or just gloss over or skip over the um, the future state uh, definition is the, the software vendors. I mean, the software vendors want nothing more than you just to ignore your current state and focus on how their software is going to make your, your life so much better. So when you're already feeling that fatigue and then you've got a software vendor or system integrator whispering in your ear that says, hey, don't worry about current state, doesn't matter, you're going to change it anyway, so why bother? That leads to a lot of you know, sort of bias, if you will, to to gloss over that. Now, having said that, I think there's something buried in your question there that I think is worth noting, which is the fatigue part of it. The reason organizations get fatigued with defining the the business requirements and the business needs and all that stuff is because a lot of times they get lost in analysis paralysis. So on one hand, you don't want to gloss over or skip over the, the current state. But on the other hand, you don't want to go so far that you, you do get that change fatigue and you get confused and you just, you're starting to overthink things. Um, and the key to that is really to prioritize your, your business. I mean, you have to, you have to do this. It's hard to do because it's hard to tell someone in the organization that, you know, this function is, is it number one priority and this one is not. Um, it's hard to tell those in the one that's not, it's hard to tell them that their part of the business is not as important. And it's not even that it's not important. It's that it's not going to have as big of an impact on the decision criteria. And the decision criteria typically are more focused on things that are differentiators for you as a business um, and or things that are differentiators of different systems in the market. So it really has nothing to do with whether or not a function is important. It has to do with whether or not that function or that specific requirement is a differentiator for you as a business. And it's something that's going to differentiate the different systems in the market to help you make a decision. So just to give you an example, if you have like a, uh, if you're a manufacturer of a complex engineer order product, um, having an integrated CPQ or configure price quote um, sales order processing workflow is really important. Um, that is going to be, in most cases, more important than, say, accounts payable processing, how quickly you can pay vendors. Um, you can see, you know, that's sort of an extreme example of two business processes that are on the opposite sides of the spectrum. But you can see how you might spend a little bit more time on that configure price quote or some of the manufacturing processes or the uh, the sales configuration processes. You can see why you might want to spend more time defining those needs versus spending time defining how a GL is set up or how you process invoices to pay vendors faster, that sort of thing. So that's what you have to do is really prioritize. And that helps you focus to where hopefully you don't end up with change fatigue and you don't go down that path of um, erroneously thinking that you could, should just skip over uh, some of those current state requirements. Yeah, that's a great summary. Absolutely. Um, and if you do want to hear more from many or ask him questions directly, as Eric mentioned, our uh, 2023 stratosphere is coming up here in October 4th through, through 6th in our Denver um, office. So uh, if you'd like to register for that, we do have a special promo code, as Eric and many uh, mentioned. It's STRAT20. Um, and you can look at all of the agenda and register and book your room through our um, stratosphere2023.com page. So definitely head over there and and sign up to kind of ask Eric and Mehdi about this really important step in a digital transformation project. Because again, if it is missed or it, it is seen as so hard, the perceptions not only on the technical side can be a mismatch on the software selection, but also the people, right? They thought, wow, that's only the first step. <laughs> this is right. going to be a really difficult process. Um, so it's important to get that communication organizational change activated as well. Um, so thank you for that great conversation and thank you to Medi for his amazing insight. Yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely have to have him on the show again at some point in the near future. And uh, in the meantime, we'll look forward to seeing him at Stratosphere 2023 uh, at stratosphere2023.com. Be sure to check it out and uh, register if you haven't already. Um, we'll go to, and speaking of Stratosphere, we're going to cover a couple of topics here for the remainder of this episode, uh, a couple topics that we'll dive into at Stratosphere as well. We're going to cover here uh, at a high level, at least here in the podcast today. We're going to get into how to simplify digital transformation and also how ERP influences business costs. We're going to get into those two topics and uh, two two of our YouTube videos that we recently released. We'll play you those clips uh, here in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. When I wake up. Well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you when I go out. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. 
I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you or in the links below for this particular podcast episode. You can find a link to uh, take you to the page that will allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the Guide to Organizational Change Management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and you can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to play you a couple clips of a, a couple different videos from our YouTube channels. One is from uh, my individual YouTube channel called uh, Not Very Creatively. It's just called Eric Kimberling. Uh, that's the name of the, the channel. Um, and then the other one is from the Third Stage Consulting uh, YouTube channel. Um, so we'll play you the one that I recently released. It's called How to Simplify Digital Transformation. And it's, it's sort of a, a roadmap or a 10-minute overview of what it takes to really simplify and get down to the basics of what is a very complex topic called digital transformation. How do we take something that's super complex like that and how do we boil it down to something a little bit more, more simplified and how do we simplify it for our organization? So that was really the intent of the video. So why don't we play the video here and uh, we'll, we'll unpack it a bit and then we'll play you another clip after that. And by the way, this is a, one of many topics and subtopics that we'll be covering at our Stratosphere Conference, our digital Stratosphere Conference in October in Denver. Um, you can go to stratosphere2023.com to learn more about the event. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and roll the clip. Digital transformations can be complex endeavors. There's a lot of details and moving parts to keep track of, and it can be overwhelming to understand what digital transformation is and how to make it successful. But how do we simplify digital transformation? That's what I want to talk about here today. My name is Eric Kibberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And as we're learning about and preparing for digital transformations, it's oftentimes easy to get lost in the complexity and the details of digital transformation. It could be overwhelming with all the different concepts and technical terms and different types of technologies and things to worry about and to manage during a digital transformation. But sometimes we forget to simplify things, just to boil it down to the basic fundamentals so that we can understand and be more effective at digital transformations. So what I want to do today is really try to boil down digital transformation into something very simple and digestible so that you can manage your project more effectively. Now, for more information and best practices around digital transformation, I encourage you to download our digital transformation report. It's an annual report we publish each year that covers the best practices you need to know to make your digital transformation successful. And it also provides independent reviews and rankings of different softwares and technologies in the digital transformation space. You can read that white paper and that report by scanning the QR code in front of you, or you can go to the links in the description field below. One of the first ways that we recommend clients potentially simplify their digital transformation is to actually reduce the technical scope of their project. This may sound counterintuitive. Why would we reduce technology in a digital transformation? But the reality is, is most organizations bite off more than they can chew. They try to implement too much technology in too little time, and they end up neglecting the more important parts of digital transformation. And I'm gonna talk about some of those more important parts of digital transformation later in this video. But the key here is to really focus in on those highest value areas that you can implement to get the most value in your business organization with the lowest amount of risk. If you try to bite off more than you can chew or you try to do too much in too little time, you're going to end up with too much technology that adds to the complexity of your transformation. It's gonna cause you to neglect the more important parts of your transformation. And it's gonna leave you with a bunch of technology that you don't end up using or getting value out of. So one of the first things you can do to simplify your digital transformation is really simplify the technology itself and really prioritize and focus on those areas where you're gonna get the most immediate and long-term business value.
Another thing we can do to reduce the complexity and to simplify digital transformation is to really focus on not just big, massive technologies that automate an entire enterprise, but to focus on technologies that address specific needs within our business. And one of the ways to do that is to deploy point solutions or functionally focused types of solutions that focus on solving a finite set of problems. In other words, we want to deploy technologies that aren't necessarily trying to fix every problem or every opportunity for improvement within our organization, but instead are focused on the highest value parts of our organization. So for example, instead of deploying an enterprise-wide technology that's going to take years to implement and adds a lot of cost and complexity and risk to your organization, we might instead say, well, let's focus on some functional areas within our business that we have the most immediate opportunity for improvement. If that immediate opportunity for improvement involves selling more and generating more revenue, then perhaps a CRM or a customer relationship management type of technology might be a better, more simple solution. If human resources and talent management is one of your biggest pain points or opportunities for improvement, perhaps HR technologies like Workday and UKG or other types of HCM technologies might be better solutions. Or finally, just one more example might be supply chain management solutions. If you're really struggling to manage your supply chain effectively, why deploy an enterprise-wide technology to solve that one problem when you could deploy a solution or a technology that fixes your supply chain? So those are just a few examples of how you might really boil down or narrow the scope of what your technology deployment is in a way that focuses on point solutions and industry or niche focus solutions that are going to be more effective than trying to deploy technology across your entire enterprise. The human dimension of digital transformation is arguably the most difficult and the most complex part of a digital transformation. The technology itself can overwhelm a team. It can create a lot of complexity and risk and challenges and problems during an implementation. But those technical challenges pale in comparison to the human-centric aspects of digital transformation. In other words, human behavior is very difficult to change. And anytime you introduce organizational change into an organization, it's gonna create challenges and problems and complexities that are hard to predict. So strangely enough, the more time you spend focusing on this really complex part of the digital transformation, which is the human or the change management part of digital transformation, the more likely it is that you're gonna reduce the complexity and you're gonna address that complexity that's introduced as part of those human issues. So having a robust change management plan, a clear and effective change strategy, and a very deliberate way of addressing these human aspects of digital transformation is one of the best ways you can reduce complexity and risk within a digital transformation. Now, I won't dive into all the different dimensions of change management or provide any strategies or tips in this video as it relates to change management, but I do have a playlist on my YouTube channel, which you can find right here, that focuses on all change management related content and videos. You could also read my guide to organizational change management, which you can read by scanning this QR code in front of you right here. And you can also find links to both of those resources in the description field below. One of the most effective tips that I can provide to help reduce complexity and risk within an organization's digital transformation is to really focus on alignment. More specifically, reducing misalignment within an organization. Every organization has a certain amount of misalignment. There's internal politics, there's organizational psychology, there's different individual personalities and different components of organizational behavior that we have to be aware of, and that creates complexity, it creates misalignment. And every organization has a certain degree of misalignment. So the key here is to understand what is the source of misalignment, where are we misaligned, and how can we get everyone on the same page to understand what this digital transformation is and what it means to our organization. If we can do that, we can turn what are typically headwinds in the form of misalignment into tailwinds, which support the project and actually speed things up in the form of alignment. Just to give you a quick example, if I'm a leader within an organization where the executive team is infighting, we're not on the same page, we don't see things the same way in terms of where we're headed as an organization, we're highly unlikely to be successful in any sort of digital transformation. No matter how well that digital transformation is run and managed, we could have the best technology, the best implementation team, perfect solution for our organization, but the fact that we're misaligned is gonna create so many problems that we're highly unlikely, if not very unlikely to be successful. So one of the things we need to do is make sure that we address those areas of misalignment and get aligned, get on the same page to ultimately reduce the complexity of digital transformation.
Another way that we can reduce complexity in digital transformation is to provide focus and direction for our digital transformation team. And one of the best ways we can do that is to provide measurable targets and expectations for what we want the digital transformation to do for our organization. Now, a lot of times when people think about metrics or performance measures for digital transformation, they focus on things like finishing the project on time and on budget. And those are very important, don't get me wrong, but what's even more important and even more impactful to an organization is what is the measurable impact that this digital transformation will have on our overall organization after we've gone through the transformation. So having a clear roadmap to what our expected business benefits are, our benefits realization and our value creation plan is very important. And not only does that help ensure that we get the business value we expect to get out of our technological investments, but it also provides us sort of a North Star or guiding light for the digital transformation team so that they can focus on the things that are actually going to deliver business value during a digital transformation. And it's also gonna help ensure that they don't go off track and start getting into rabbit holes and going down rabbit holes of technology and other sorts of process changes that aren't adding business value to the organization. So one of the biggest things you could do to decrease complexity in your digital transformation is really focus on these measurable components of digital transformation. So I hope this has provided you some guidance on how to simplify and demystify the complexity of digital transformation. For more best practices and lessons learned and tips and ideas on how to make your digital transformation more successful, I encourage you to download and read our digital transformation report. It's a report we publish each year, features a number of independent reviews and rankings of different software solutions, as well as implementation best practices for organizations about to go through a digital transformation. You can read that report by scanning the QR code in front of you right here, or you can go to the links below in the description field to find that. So I hope you found this information useful and hope you have a great day. Okay, that was a clip of a video from my YouTube channel called How to Simplify Digital Transformation. Uh, we're gonna uh, debrief on that briefly and then we're gonna play you another video in just a moment, but first we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you wanna feel? I'll give you energy. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. And Kyla, we just uh, played the uh, How to Simplify Digital Transformation video. Um, what are some of your thoughts from that video and some of the takeaways from it? Yeah, well, it's it's really kind of a, a, a really basic yet complex, if you will, um, playbook of how to simplify your digital transformation. And I think that's the reason that this one, I feel like, is a great preview of what you talk about at Stratosphere, what our speakers will talk about at Stratosphere, is kind of breaking down the actual needs of your organization to really remember why you're doing this. What is your why behind it? Um, what is your strategic vision? And not getting bogged down in the details, um, which can be very, very difficult. So understanding kind of the structure you need around um, an ERP implementation or a best of breed at any technology implementation, but understanding the nuance of the strategic approach is so important. And that's really what Stratosphere is all about, is an unbiased, there's no vendor sponsors, nothing like that, um, opportunity for you to actually work on your own enterprise technology strategy. We do have some vendors that will be there presenting, which I think is a great opportunity for you to actually ask questions to their executive team about potentially looking at their software or optimizing their software. But this video really showcases the ability to step back and say, this is the actual strategy 
that I need to implement. And yes, of course, there's going to be pivots. Of course, there's going to need to be agile in some areas and be flexible. But when it comes to why are we doing this? What is our strategy around it? It's really kind of the manifesto for your digital transformation. I think that's why this video is so important and really just a, a sneak preview of what a lot of our speakers will be presenting at Stratosphere. Yeah, and that's really what we're going for in this uh, event. On one hand, we're going deep into a lot of these different categories and subcategories of digital transformation. But on the other hand, we're trying to simplify it too and make it something that's not daunting or overwhelming for project teams and organizations and, and whatnot. So uh, hopefully the video accomplished that. And, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that the conference in October in Denver, it's Digital Stratosphere 2023. I'm confident that we'll be able to do it uh, even more effectively in person as well. Absolutely. Definitely not to miss. Um, I would be going to ask everyone questions. And that's why we pick these speakers. Eric Hinn picks the speakers, um, just a little look behind the scene, so that they are approachable, so that they're willing to engage with our audience. There's no ego in that conversation. So it's a great opportunity to really get face-to-face -face time with a thought leader or a vendor or an expert in the space to ask questions. Um, for our VAP clients, they do have a full strategy session on the Friday. Friday, um, the 6th. So they're up, give that opportunity to sit down with our executive team. Um, it really is a, a great investment. So 10 out of 10 would recommend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a lot of fun with these. Uh, every time we do, I mean, we did, uh, I think, three or four of them before COVID and then COVID hit and we haven't done one in person since COVID, but this will be our first one back. But every time we've done it in person, in particular, um, it's just, they're so good. I mean, you just get so much rich content, not in the, not, it's not even just the sessions themselves. It's also the, the uh, informal breakouts and the networking and the, you know, social aspect of it too. There's just a lot you get out of it that you're not going to get in an online event. So um, we're really looking forward to being, being in person again uh, here in October. And uh, we're going to show you one more clip. Actually, we're going to roll you another clip right now. Um, another of another topic that we'll touch on at various points throughout the conference, I'm sure, which is how ERP influences business cost. And this is a video that you uh, created, Kyler, for the third stage channel. So let's go ahead and roll the clip here and we'll we'll debrief here after we we play this clip. Implementing a new ERP or best of breed solution is a great way to reduce costs and excess operations for your business, creating a strategy of efficiency. If you're looking for ways to optimize your business operations and cut those crucial costs, especially in today's business landscape, you're in the right place. I'm Heather Cheatham with Third Stage Consulting Group. We are a global technology agnostic and independent advisory firm that helps our clients reach the third stage of their digital transformation. In today's video, we'll explore the role of ERP or best of breed solutions in reducing those important business costs. Enterprise resource planning systems or ERP systems are really powerful tools that can help businesses streamline those important processes, improve efficiencies, and ultimately save money. If you're new here, first welcome, and please consider subscribing or hitting that notifications button in order to stay up to date on the latest trends in digital transformation or enterprise tech content. Now let's dive into our segment today. So before we get into the meat of this conversation, I want to recommend one resource that we have for free download here at Third Stage. It's our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report, and you can find it in the link below wherever you're getting this video or podcast. I highly recommend it as it is a 60 plus page playbook that really can walk you through each phase of digital transformation, ensuring that you really optimize that business value of your new technology. So before we do a deeper dive into how ERP systems can reduce business costs, let's quickly grasp the idea of what ERP is and its benefits. So what is ERP? ERP is an integrated software system that centralizes and automates various business processes across the business and different departments, such as finance, human resources, supply chain, customer relationship management, and much more. Another huge benefit of an ERP system or an interoperability piece solution is that it's streamlined process. ERP eliminates redundant tasks and data entry by integrating processes 
and leading to greater operational efficiency. Another huge benefit of an ERP system is that enhanced data management and visibility. An ERP solution provides real-time data and analytics enabling the business to make those data-driven decisions and identify areas of any cost-saving improvements or efficiency opportunities. So now that we've defined what is ERP and what are some of the benefits, let's really dive into some of those direct cost savings that contribute to reducing business costs. So one of the first is inventory management. ERP systems optimize inventory levels by providing accurate demand forecasts and inventory tracking, preventing any sort of overstocking or stock outs, thus reducing any carrying costs that might not be moving out of your warehouse. The second is supply chain management and procurement. Now ERP really streamlines the procurement process allowing businesses to negotiate better deals with suppliers, consolidate those purchases, and take advantage of bulk discounts. This is one area that we really see as a main cost savings for ERP systems or our clients that implement ERP systems because it allows them to lean out their business costs and really understand where their raw materials are coming from. It also diversifies their supply chain. So if there is any issues with getting raw material or specific goods that they need to produce their product, they have that inventory portfolio in which they can go to another supplier and get that cost savings. Another huge cost savings that we see is in financial management. An ERP system or a best of breed finance system can really automate financial processes that are involved in things like invoicing, accounts payable, and expense management. This efficiency really reduces the time and effort spent on those manual tasks, specifically within the financial departments of your organization. Resource optimization is another huge cost saving area. An ERP system helps in effective resource allocation by analyzing that data on employees' performance, machine utilization, production output, leading, and cost efficiency operations. It gives you the opportunity to not discipline the employee, but coach on more efficient work production or move employees in areas where they may excel throughout the organization. Another area in which we see ERP systems really help those cost savings is reducing IT complexity. An ERP system replaces multiple standalone systems with a single integrated platform. This really cuts down on IT maintenance and software licensing costs. Let's take a look at some real world case studies and examples that demonstrate how ERP implementation has successfully reduced business costs. So let's take company A, we'll call them for example. After implementing an ERP, company A reduced its inventory carrying costs by 20% through optimized stock levels and those improved demand forecasting. Now let's look at company B. Company B also streamlined its production process with ERP, but it resulted in a 15% reduction in production cycle times and correspondingly decreased in labor costs. Now let's look at company C. Company C by centralizing financial data and automating invoice and payment processes, company C cut its accounts payable processing costs by 30%. Now these results don't mean that's exactly what you'll get for your company, but understanding those cost savings areas where we're looking at resources, time, efficiencies, and just overall costs of manual tasks, you really have an opportunity to lead out your organizations through a centralized ERP business cost solution. We're here playing you a clip from Kyler talking about how ERP influences business cost. We've got a lot more to get to in this clip, so stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, your host here on Transformation Ground Control. I want to personally invite you to our upcoming Stratosphere 2023 event. It's a conference that we host every year. It's a tech agnostic conference. 
features a number of independent technology agnostic speakers, both from third stage consulting, as well as from outside our company. We try to bring in the, the industry's brightest minds and the most objective minds to help you learn the things you need to know to make your transformation successful. We cover everything from digital strategy to software evaluation, to change management, to program management, to process improvement, data and architecture, migration, all that kind of stuff we're going to cover here in Digital Stratosphere. It's going to be October 4th, 5th, and 6th in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there. Kyler will be there, our co-host here on Transformation Ground Control, as well as others will be there. So be sure to check us out. We'll also have great opportunities for networking, for peer networking, as well as networking with speakers. We're also going to have great entertainment too. We'll have some happy hour networking events, as well as live music from that 80s band, which is uh, my favorite cover band. They play all 80s stuff. Uh, so come enjoy that as well while you're, while you're at it. It's all happening in Denver, October 4, 5, and 6. Uh, you can go to stratosphere2023.com to learn more about the event. Be sure to register by August 15th to get the early bird discounts, which is uh, fairly significant. Again, stratosphere2023.com. Learn more about it. Hope to see you there. And uh, in the meantime, hope you enjoy the rest of this episode of Transformation Ground Control. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 137. We're here playing you a clip of how ERP influences business cost. Let's go ahead and continue the clip here. Now, while ERP systems offer significant cost savings potential, successful implementation is truly key, or you will not realize that business value that we just discussed with company A, B, and C. Here are some tips that I'll walk you through for a smooth ERP implementation. Now, I want to precursor this conversation with identifying that each organization is different. So when you go into implementation planning, you really need to have that awareness of what your needs are and your goals as a business in order to create a streamlined implementation plan. Here at Third Stage, we help our clients do that through achieving that independent and technology agnostic advice. Please don't get your implementation planning from an SI or a vendor as knowing their agendas might be different from the pure goals of your business. If you have questions about a custom implementation plan, please feel free to reach out to me directly at kyler.cheatham at thirdstage-consulting.com. My contact info is also in the description. So let's go over some high level tips that every implementation can integrate in order to optimize their project for success. So the first one that we kind of talked about in that intro was clearly defining objectives. So we need to set clear and measurable goals for the ERP implementation that focus on cost savings areas. So it's about having a discussion of where do we wanna save costs or create efficiencies within our organization. Having that alignment in the beginning of the project planning or the implementation planning is going to ensure everyone is marching to the same beat when they're looking at ways to optimize your project. It also gives you measurable goals post go live and after those key metrics are implemented to ensure that your digital transformation is a journey, not just one destination. My second tip is really choosing the right ERP system. Select an ERP system that truly aligns with the needs of your organization and offers modules to address those specific cost savings requirements. I can't tell you how many times we've seen a business within an evaluation process that their system is either being sun-sended or their vendor is trying to push them into a cloud solution because software members, vendors make more money off of that. What you want to do is really identify your needs as a business, look at those goals and objectives through cost savings, and understand and evaluate which software makes sense for you. If you have more questions about software selection, I have the software selection guidebook in the link below in any description of where you're getting this video or podcast. You can also look at our playlist on YouTube, which I'll link right here for software selection specifically. The next tip I have for you is involve key stakeholders. Engage employees, department heads, and management all in the implementation process to ensure buy-in and cooperation. As I mentioned earlier, this alignment is going to be critical to ensure you have a smooth implementation. My last tip, and is something that a lot of organizations overlooked, is thorough user adoption strategies. 
So this is not just trading, it's planning of how you ensure that your employees are actually having a positive experience with your technology. So you want to provide that comprehensive trading to employees to maximize the benefits of the ERP system and its new cost saving features, but also ensure that you have an effective communication plan, that you've offered a feedback cycle for employees to really be engaged with this decision throughout the business. ERP systems are more than just business management software. They are powerful allies in the quest to reduce business costs and drive efficiencies. By streamlining processes, enhancing that data visibility, and optimizing resources, ERP systems empower businesses to make informed decisions and improve their bottom line. If you found this information helpful, please give us a thumbs up and share with your colleagues who might benefit from this. Please also don't forget to comment below on your thoughts and experience about ERP implementation, specifically when it comes to cost savings. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I also highly recommend you download our 2023 Digital Transformation Report, which can be found in the link below, for all things that will optimize your project, including cost savings. I'm Mother Cheetah from Third Stage Consulting Group. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I will see you next time. All right, great video, Kyler. That was an interesting topic and, a, and one that should be top of mind for any organization or project team going through a digital transformation. I love uh, hosting this podcast, but one thing I love even more than hosting this podcast is, are the in-person events. So hopefully we'll get to see much of the audience there, especially those of you that are in a position to be able to travel to uh, to Denver in the United States. We'd love to see you there. In fact, so far we have we have people that are relatively close to Denver, and then we, we have one registrant that's coming from Taiwan. I think that's so far. That person holds the uh, the records for this event for the longest distance traveled, but uh, maybe there's others out there. They're gonna they're gonna beat him uh, on that on that too. So wherever you are in the world, hopefully you can join us here in Denver, uh, October fourth through the sixth. You can go to stratosphere2023.com to learn more about it and to view the agenda. Use uh, the promo code strat twenty s t r a t two zero and get twenty percent off the uh, registration pass. So be sure to join us there. So. Uh, Thank you for another great episode, Kyler, and uh, thank you to the audience for a great episode as well. Great questions and participation, and uh, particularly the questions that we cover in the opening segment. That's uh, my personal favorite is uh, getting to the audience questions because I never know where where they're going to take us. So that's the best part of the, the conversation. So thank you for that. And uh, again, new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, or audio podcast platforms, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us there. So be sure to check us out there. I uh, hope you have a great week in the meantime, and we'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control. Thank you.